Hi. All right. So over the next two videos, I'm going to be talking to you about two amazing books. This is written by Michael D. Watkins, a well-known voice in the field of um, career transitions. And this is written uh, by Roger L. Martin, an amazing voice in the field of uh, strategy. Um, I've already read this one, and I'm about to read this one. Now, today, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about the first 90 days. And I have a lot of thoughts to share about um, how the book actually made its impression on me. Uh, Michael D. Watkins is absolutely brilliant. And this book, as you can see, was written about 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, right? Just yeah. to leave a caveat, these days, uh, when you use the word T-R-A-N-S, you probably think about many things that are common, that are controversial, particularly the issue of a, the fist of a man meeting the face of a woman while the world watches. Obviously, that is not the kind of transition I'm going to talk about today. This kind of transition I'm going to talk about is career transitions based on this book, The First 19 Days. I took some notes, and I'm just going to be looking at them once in a while as I share my thoughts. Uh, Michael D. Watkins, uh, out of his work, uh, I believe, started the company Genesis Advisors, basically doing um, uh, coaching for high-level uh, executives at the VP uh, level, at the director level, for individuals who are moving from one role to another, who are transiting roles. Such transition could inc include promotions. They could include uh, moving from one role to another in the, at the same level, uh, you know, lateral movements. Could include changing location while accepting a new role. That is a geographic movement and it touches on very interesting um components of 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 of, of uh, uh, factors that could impact uh, such a move uh, and it's so interesting how deep he he goes into it in his book right so according to um watkins he measured or he uh, noticed about 13.5 transitions per person in the space of the, the span of years he studied, which was about 18.2 years, which means uh, that the, the average person is, is basically always moving at that level. And you can see this if you just go over to LinkedIn and you check out um, people's profiles, you will see how many times they've had to change jobs. Though that, that change of job may be they got promoted, that change of job could be they got, uh, they got a new job, transited from one to the other, that change of job could be the moved, right? Now, I don't know what it's probably responsible for this. Maybe we have, we live in an era where people don't fancy the, the, the concept of working for one company for 30 years and retiring anymore. It could also be that the, the manner in which job adverts are rolled out, uh, um, the, the manner in which talent uh, management is being handled it, with digital meta methods, with platforms like LinkedIn, Indeed, and so forth, it's so much easier to get somebody to move from his former role to another or to move from his former company to another and so forth. So much easier. And, and people are looking for talent everywhere. So generally, there's that high volume of talents moving across boundaries, moving across organizations, moving across the corporate ladder. All right, so th there is the impact of that. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of the chapters of this book that I read, and then um, I will talk a bit about some of the things that struck me deeply as I, you know, went through reading the book that I remember. Now, uh, the, the first chapter uh, after the introduction is prepare yourself, right? Prepare yourself, right? Is that he, he introduces the chapter or he summarizes the chapter by saying that many people fail to make a mental break from their old jobs. Now, so what that means is that um, people are promoted for what they do, they, what they accomplish typically. Typically when you are a high performer, management notices and then says, oh, we can give this person new responsibilities. 
this person needs to do more for us because of their capacity, their talent, their work ethic, their management progress, whatever it is. But the thing is that when you, uh, you know, embrace that new role, you are expected to do something different from what got you there. So there is a level of preparation you have to make in terms of embracing the requirements of the new role. And if people fail to embrace those requirements, if they, if they fail to realize that I'm not going to keep doing what I was doing before, I have to do something new. Uh, and, and if I'm going to do something new, then I have to learn something new in order to be able to do it. And, and learning has to be accelerated. It goes deeper into this in chapter two, where he talks about accelerating learning, right? Because his philosophy is that if you are going to succeed as a leader, you have to make reasonable impact within the first 90 days. 90 days, three months. And he says that, look, uh, month one, month one is sort of like a break even point. You have to, you have to identify that break even point. There's a, actually an, a neat diagram for it where it talks about that break even point. Before I show you that, I'll just show you two quick diagrams that where he talks about the vicious cycle of transitions and the virtuous cycle of transitions. Maybe even want to pause that video, zoom into that and take a look. I'm not going to, I can't show you everything. It's not my book. So I, I probably need to be careful about the the copyright, but they are in very interesting concepts, models, diagrams, tools that he outlines in this book. So that has to do with learning a lot, learning a lot. Uh, there's the break even point uh, when, when you are moving within that space of 90 days to, to say, look, um, I, I need to show value at this point. I need to show value. I need to show that I was the right person that was hired. Right. So he shows us the break even point. Uh, it says that that is basically at one month, you you must um, you must be transiting from the value you are consuming from your learnings to value you are pro producing, and he, he he later in the chapter he now talks about securing early wins, which is part of the way in which you demonstrate your value within the first ninety days, gain acceptance, gain a, a strong reputation, and then ride the wave to build your um, your success build upon your success in that uh, organization uh, it talks a lot in this in this breaking point con concept it talks about uh, avoiding the transition traps right i mean things like sticking with what you know things like thinking you have the perfect answer to the organization's problems when you have not uh, spent time to learn about the organization and one area of learning which he, he talks about a lot is culture we, we technically we know what to do in our various careers and professions but when it comes to embracing a new role uh, going into management or even a new organization it's more important to learn about the politics of leadership sometimes the culture of the organization rather than just saying i know what to do technically speaking and that's so, such an important point that it makes and another interesting thing that comes out in these learning in these um, well, uh, transition traps is the concept of neglecting horizontal relationships. Typically, as a leader, you, you feel that I'm now in a top position. I have to impress my boss and my MD and my CEO and all that. But there is also that aspect of how do I form alliances with those who I'm going to be working with? Because some changes have to be driven in such a way that they are driven in, 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 by, by co-creating, by collaborating with others who are influencers in the areas that you're trying to make change. So you don't come with, in quote, the answer. You come to learn and then to uh, uh, align with others. All right, in chapter three, it talks about managing, matching the strategy to the situation. Matching the strategy to the situation. In this chapter, there's an interesting concept that I, I saw it for the first time reading this book it's it's called the stars model right the stars model the stars model here now th this stars model is about what stage of change is the organization at that you are called to lead is the department at that you are called to lead that stage of change could be that it's a startup 
if it's a startup um basically what you're saying is you're assembling the capabilities that you need to get this company moving it could be a turnaround maybe the business has uh, is is basically nose diving and you need to basically revive things on, on, and and bring things back to 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 a, a comfortable state of 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 you know cruising if you like it could be a stage of accelerated growth where things are moving fast the company is moving from 40 people to 400 people to 4000 people and there's a need to a, a certain kind of leadership required right it could be a realignment where um you there was this there's this success that was in the past and you need to basically shape the organization again to come back to its position of success it could also be you are required to sustain success the, the organization is succeeding there's no turnaround required there's no bootstrapping required what you just need to is to maintain that cruise level so is that that's called the start model startup turnaround accelerated growth realignment and sustaining success it's such an amazing insight and and the 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 point he makes with it the strong point he makes with it is that the kind of leadership required for these different you know stages differs so you do, you don't come into a, a situation uh, right it's a situation that requires accelerated growth and you are leading as if it's a startup you know or you are leading as if you are trying to sustain success so you need to uh, think about it as a leader so if, if you read the book you, you realize this is written for leaders and it, it brought my attention to um you know my john c maxwell's concept of leadership i was deeply exposed to it when i was much younger that john c maxwell talks about the fact that leadership is influence and i think it's uh, i heard from mensa utabil as well the concept of positional leadership versus um actual you know uh, leadership that it comes as a result of someone taking responsibility if i take responsibility i may not be the appointed leader but i have capacity to lead so i should i could have influence horizontal influence without necessarily being the positional leader so that said that means that michael watkins book applies to everyone who is leading in some way or who is expected to lead in some way called up to lead in some way all right chapter four talks about negotiating success and this is another powerful concept there are five core conversations that you have to have with your leader in negotiating uh, success michael watson says that this is your responsibility as the new leader taking on a new role moving to a new uh, environment moving into a new company to do something new the first conversation is a situational diagnosis now what's happening here what's the stars model here what's your expectation etc then there is a conversation of um expectations that the boss has what 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 would he recognize as success right there's a conversation of resources what is he willing to make available to you human resources and other resources to make sure that you are successful what is his leadership style does it allow you to make all the decisions does he provide guidance right how does he like to meet does he meet one-on-one -on -one? does he talk about things in the group and so forth and one of the areas where uh, michael talked uh, touched on was in this new world of hybrid work where in many ways in many cases you have to talk to people over uh, over uh, media like this like i'm speaking to you now and uh, how does your leader like it does he like to make calls or does he like to uh, write emails and so forth right that's very important to know how to make an impression on the uh, uh leader right and, and and there are other two other conversations that you have to have in order to um establish the foundation for your delivery uh, establish the foundations for for delivering right so so those are the five conversations that that are in that in that context um yes in negotiating success situational diagnosis the expectations conversation the resource conversation the style conversation and the personal development conversation your own development is an important part of that conversation with your boss all right so chapter four this is chapter four chapter five 
I talked about securing early win that I mentioned this before. He, uh, Michael D. Watkins dedicates a whole chapter to the concept of finding something that is aligned with the organization's vision that you can deliver on quickly within your first 90 days. It doesn't have to be perfect. It, it just has to show your capacity. And you then begin to ride those waves to move to the next uh, levels, if, if you like. Just ride those waves from the point at which you make your early uh, wins. Chapter six talks about achieving alignment. And that's basically alignment with um, the organization's goals. He talks about something called an organizational architect. And uh, uh, trust me, as an enterprise architect, a few of the things he said, uh, are probably the part of the, the support that an enterprise architect or a business architect more specifically would give to uh, a CIO in the, in, in the world of uh, business. Uh, but that's a lot of changing hap A lot of changes are happening in those spheres right now. So I, I saw the concept of an organization architect here for the first time as well. And here he shows us what uh, the elements of an organizational architecture are. Strategic direction, structure, skills basis, core processes and these have some similarities to some of the concepts we'll talk about in business architecture but the point he's making is that um the the leader has to basically build this model you have to build this model and then use this model to um as the basis to achieve alignment in terms of what you're doing with uh the overall uh, vision of the organization chapter seven talks about building it, your team that's where you basically say who am I going to work with in this my new role? Who am I going to work with in this new role, right? Do I work with those who are already there? Do I uh, work with those who are, uh, do I pick my own team? What is the basis on that? Are, are there things, uh, are, are there people I want to fire or hire? When do I want to fire or hire them? Can I meet people one-on-one -on -one and find out who's there already? All sorts of decisions that you have to take as a uh, leader. The rest of the three chapters talk about um creating alliances which is a build-up from the last mention managing yourself and there was a very interesting story that he, he shared uh, michael watkins shared in this concept of uh, managing yourself and he did share stories from at least five professionals in the whole book i'll mention their names you can go check them out on linkedin and while you're doing so check me out on linkedin and let's connect uh, you go, go check them out. But in this particular one, it struck me because he made allusions to the impact of a career move on family. And it says part of managing yourself is being able to um, work strategically around what the impact of your next move, your next career move, whether it's a promotion or in this case, moving to a geographically different place means for the rest of your family. And that was an interesting insight because it's not just about the world of work it's about whether you are doing enough on the home front to make sure you are stable enough sane enough uh, put together enough to deliver uh, on your job in the office and that's so, so powerful so insightful and um, then uh, chapter 10 is another powerful chapter as well accelerate everyone so that means that if i'm going to accelerate my performance and push myself to deliver results in 90 days, I should also think about doing the same for my team, for those who are going to be reporting to me. And as an organization, you want to make the, the culture of transition coaching, which it differentiates from developmental coaching. You want to make that culture, that system, is something that is intentional. So that when you promote people within the organization, they have the support they need to transition. When you onboard people, they have the support they need to transition. And this includes even things outside of the workplace, like, for example, looking for new um, schools for children. Imagine that. So, so that is an, uh, also a powerful one. Accelerate everyone. Create a, a system within the organization that supports people who are transitioning. That's also very, very uh, powerful. Um, Michael D. Watkins caught my attention significantly with the concept of SWOT versus TOES. I have uh, been exposed to SWOT versus TOES before, and I previously viewed them as simply two different ways of approaching the same 
uh, concept of uh, basically checking where you are as a person, as an organization. I use SWOT in the interactive ideation session when I um, engage emerging entrepreneurs. But one of the things he said in this book is that uh, uh, while SWOT was designed to start from internal diagnosis or internal assessment, what are my strengths and weaknesses, then goes on to what are the opportunities and the threats out there. It may be more valuable for an organization to first of all assess external uh, factors before uh, coming internally, which means saying, what are the threats and opportunities out there? And before saying, what are my strengths and weaknesses? And that makes a lot of sense. If, for example, you're thinking about it from a strategic perspective, you want to think about the big picture first and then ask yourself, where do I fit into the big picture? So I'm, I'm definitely thinking about whether I'm going to change that model, uh, the, the approach to using the, the, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threats, or uh, threats, opportunities, uh, uh, threats, opportunities, strengths, weaknesses model in the interactive ideation session. Two other three interesting things I'll mention that show up in this book are the um, influence diagram and then the concept of fog lab, right? The influence diagram is basically a way to say, um, I know that there are people I need to influence in order to drive my change. These people may or may not be my bosses, right? They may not be my direct reports, but they need to be carried along. I need to uh, somehow uh, contribute or drop a dot in their opinion about what I'm going to do, if I'm going to do it successfully. So this concept of an influence diagram is being able to sit down, plan and say, who do I need to influence in order to drive my change at home? So the last one I'll, I'll just mention is the Foglam checklist. So this is basically saying um, it's an acronym. And what is it trying to address? It's trying to address how you secure early wins, which I talked about in, in that chapter. Uh, I believe that was chapter five. Focus, oversight, goals, leadership, abilities, means, and process, right? This is a way to, to basically isolate what you should be focusing on, which project will secure you an early win. And that's that's so powerful. I mentioned earlier that Michael D. Watkins used the examples, real-life examples of ASTU professionals whom he had interacted with in order to drive home his point about using the 90-day model about this concepts, these principles, these learnings from industry, uh, including Julia Guild, Hannah Jaffe, Liam Giffen, Alexander Belenko, Stephen Erickson. And it basically digs deep into their experiences uh, from the one who had to influence the right set of people to the one who had to uh, move his family from the US to Canada to the one who was uh, you know, given basically a broader role uh, from what they had because of of their performance at the lower level and did not understand the implications of that new role and so forth. So it's such a powerful book because it is practical, it is based on industry learnings, and it is so relatable. It is so relatable. The book is so relatable for me. I'm sure it probably will be relatable for you as well. So I want you to go out there, get your copy, and, and let's talk about what are your learnings, what are your um, deepest insights from the first 90 days. If you've received a promotion, if you're transiting, if you're moving to a new role, moving to a new country, it's one of those books that you really want to take and, and put into practice right away. Thank you for staying with me this long. And if you like the video, uh, I'd like you to just uh, make time to click the subscribe button and that notification bell I'm going to challenge myself to read this over the next month or so, and I'll be talking about it the next time, um, aside from all the other things that probably will go on on this channel. Thank you uh, for being there. Have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, so I'm going to share some very personal. Uh, I, I, I saved this for the back of the video because I know that not everyone watches the whole thing uh, on YouTube. I'm going to share some very personal ways in which the book, The First 90 Days, uh, made its impression on me. The first one I'd like to share is, is, is in no particular order. This is just like freestyling 
sharing my heart, being authentic, being even vulnerable, right? The first part of it was the, the concept of uh, coming with the answer. You see, because I'm, I'm relatively experienced, I've read a lot of books, have a lot of theories, certifications, this and that, there's, I have a tendency to come into a situation with what I feel is what people should do. Experience has taught me that that is always, uh, not always a very good way to approach problems. First of all, uh, people, uh, you are not, I'm not the smartest person in the room. So why should I assume that people haven't already thought about what I'm thinking about? Why should I assume that people haven't tried so many things that any new thing you're bringing on board will be questioned very deeply or will be like another masquerade kind of thing? So I, I, ha I did have that tendency to come into a situation, somebody narrates a problem the first day or somebody uh, talks about a situation in a meeting and I just pop up and say, I have this bright idea. And Watkins says, that is not a way to approach a new position. There is the period of learning that allows you to understand why things are the way they are before attempting to bring in your uh, special answer to the situation. Another thing that struck me was uh, about learning culture and politics. So as one arises on the ladder uh, within the corporate ladder, if you like, uh, he, he mentions that it's more important for you to learn politics, how to navigate your way and culture, how, why people, be, how people behave, what are the norms, unwritten uh, value systems, rather than just assuming that this is all about performing well technically, right? So there's that aspect of culture and sometimes you have to ask people questions. You have to uh, speak to the human side of people in order to you know uh, really gain the advantage you need as a new leader and remember this is particularly to leaders in the corporate world not just somebody who is typing code away as an IT person or otherwise this is particularly to leaders you need to influence you need to create value in in profound ways uh, across the organization so that aspect of policies and culture is an aspect that I really need to grow in right so that's another area of um, vulnerability then there is a third area which is the balance between family and work so there's that notion that look everything is okay as long as you're performing well and bringing in the money and and, and making your bosses happy but i was very uh, intrigued right by the example that michael d watkins gave about a certain person who had to move from the us to canada to take up a new role his wife was also working so they had the dilemma, uh, do I move first, leave my family behind, have a split family across um, countries? Uh, how do we change the schools of these children without upsetting them too much? Uh, am I gonna find a good job for my wife? And so many other questions they had to answer. And the, the fundamental conclusion in the book about this scenario was that if you have a balanced home front, it's probably gonna um, help you have also a balanced, uh, a better performance in the workplace. And, and these are the areas that I think they struggle personally because of my personal situation, because of I, I, I tend to come with the answer. Um, I am so much into the technicalities of the work rather than the humanities of it. And thirdly, uh, th there is some aspects of myself where I, I, I tilt, go overboard in the tilt between work and, and life, right? And, and that is, uh, those are important uh, concepts. All right, so let me uh, take this opportunity to tell you about my, my course, Career Growth Strategies in Information Technology. And, and, and I like to apply these learnings from this master's to uh, more uh, sublime, more, you know, um, contained scenarios in my own personal career, career as an IT person in the lives of those who I tend to influence. So I, I did this course in Udemy, Career Growth Strategies in Information Technology. It's a basic course, basic information, but I think it's very insightful information and I want you to check it out and, and think about the three strategies that I basically um, um, emphasized. I, it's, it's, one of, it's the first iteration of the course, right? 
So I'm definitely going to improve on it. Some of the quality, the sound quality issues, video quality issues over time. And the beautiful thing about Udemy is once you have the course, you have the course. So when I do the upgrades, you already have the content. And I can, I can tell you, I can promise you that some of the insights from that course are already useful as it is. So go ahead and make a buy. Once in a while, Udemy gives an offer, um, a discount. So you may want to keep a close tab on the on my landing page on Udemy and you know take up one of those offers, right? I talk about uh, the CIU strategy. I talk about the um, veteran strategy. And I talk about the uh, technical expert or SME strategy uh, in the course as well. I give examples from my own personal career growth, and um, I basically make it as practical as I can to make sure it is useful to those who are from my background. And let me touch on this uh, issue. Uh, many uh, tech techies out there, they basically leave the flow, the growth of their careers to the winds, to the winds of management decision, to the winds of opportunities, as they are called, to the winds of changing technology choices by organizations and by industry. Uh, I, I think we can be more deliberate. I think we can position ourselves better to take, get the advantage of all these moving forces. Remember that TOES model that Watkins talked about. So I think that um, um, information technology professionals should be more deliberate about making these choices, moving towards the best that they can be in the industry. Right. So please uh, take a look at that course, Career Growth Strategies in Information uh, Technology. Thank you very much for spending time with me today. Share the video. Um, make a comment. Let me hear your feedback. If you've read the book, if you've read the book, uh, you can also share your own personal experiences about the book. And I look forward to coming back to you with the second book, Playing to Win, period, which I'm also going to be reading over this period, next few months thereabout. All right, thank you. Awesome day ahead. Thank you very much for being there.